Uh, those of you who've been to my presentations here before or seen them elsewhere know that I always stand up and talk and I hardly ever use notes. But tonight that's going to be a little different for a couple of reasons. Even though I've got a lot of slides to show you, I've got dates to tell you, historical dates, and I have quotations from the people involved, and I need to be reading those to you. So I think it's going to be, I tried to do it holding those and running the slide clicker, and I ended up ending with the wrong slides on the screen all the time. So we don't want to do that. So I'm going to try to make it work better this way. The other thing I want to say before I begin is that I'm going to use the terms Indians, native people, and indigenous people interchangeably. Whatever comes out of my mouth, I'm going to say one of those. I know that there are some people who prefer only one term to all the others, or only this term to all the others. But they all refer to the same first people who lived on this continent and whose descendants are still with us today, of course. And so that's how I will be referring to them, and I mean no offense to people who prefer one term to, term to the other. Okay, so the people in this story are the Dell family, George Martin Dell, my great-grandfather, who was born in 1844 and lived until 1925, and Elizabeth Hallweg Dell, known as Lizzie, who was born in 1863 and, and lived until 1945. The other character in this story is Sitting Bull, the famous hunk, uh, hunk Papa Lakota Sioux leader, who was born, we think, around 1831 and died in 1890. And his, his name in the Lakota language is Tatanka Iotanka meaning sitting bull, and the bull doesn't refer, refer to a bull as in cattle, it refers to a bull, a bison, a buffalo bull. And the bison was the most important animal to the people who lived on the plains, the plains Indians. And by 1883, the buffalo had been, were almost extinct in, in North America because the white people had come out there, both settlers and just people sports shooting and people out to make money at different, from different parts of the buffalo carcass, they almost wiped out the buffalo. Did any of you see Ken Burns' wonderful four-hour documentary on the American buffalo? Yes, on public television. If you haven't seen it yet, look it up on PBS, public television channel. It was on just last week or the week before, and it's, it's an excellent, excellent story. And it will have some of the things about Sitting Bull in it, too. So to start with my great-grandmother, who was born in Flato, West Prussia, in 1863, and this is a photo of the main street of the town around that time. And her father was Wilhelm Hallweg. They, they dropped the second H in their name when they moved to America, but when they lived in Prussia, he was Wilhelm Hallweg. He was a master baker with a large bakery there, and his wife was Matilda Hallweg, and we fairly recently found out that they actually had 12 children, only five of which lived to adulthood, and those were the five who came with them later to America. They were ethnic Germans in a part of, of Europe that was mixed among, uh, between German, ethnic German people and ethnic Slavic people, the main, to the two main groups, and they were members of, as being Germans there in the northern part of the Lutheran Church, and this is the church they belong to in Flato, Prussia. And to give you an idea where Prussia is, see up at the top where it says the Baltic Sea. Now drop right down there, you'll see Pomerania and West Prussia. And they were right on, they were in West Prussia, but it was right on the borderline between Pomerania and West Prussia. Sometimes people mix up Russia and Prussia. Now, Russia's over there off to the right-hand side of the screen. These are Germanic lands and mixed in the east with Slavic lands, Slavic, ethnic Slavic people. And what you see in green there is the kingdom of Prussia in 1866 when they were living there. It was a kingdom then. In 1871, Bismarck uh, united these various kingdoms and principalities into the country of Germany that we know today. Most of it is in Germany that we know today. But what happened is, after World War II, in 1945, that land that was Germany for such a long time became Polish land. So it's now in Poland, 
and the name of the town is pronounced Zwatow, Poland. And I visited there in, in 1990 and have seen, you know, this, seen what it looks like now. So the Halvegs came to America in 1867. This picture dates from around 1900. This is the whole family. So the guy with the stern look and the white beard there, that's Wilhelm, my great-great-grandfather, and his wife, Matilda, who's got a really sour expression on her face. And Matilda is my great-great-great-grandmother. My great-grandmother, Elizabeth, is the one on the left that's looking a little more like she's about to smile anyway. And they initially came to New York City. They lived in New York City from 1867 to 1875, where Wilhelm, who was a professional baker in Europe, also worked as a baker in New York City. But what happened after that was his wife decided she didn't like living in the big city. And Matilda, that sour looking lady, she said, I want to move out to Iowa and homestead on a farm. And basically, you can come with me or you can stay in New York. It's up to you. And apparently, he followed her. And they moved to northwestern Iowa to, to this place, to uh, Davis Corners, northwestern Iowa. And this is the house they later built on the 360-acre uh, farmstead that they homesteaded out there. <laughs> The other side, this is my mother's side of the family. The, that's her, her people, not my, not my father's side. My mother's side of the family also are the Dells. The Dell, my mother's maiden name was Dell. And these were Quakers, and they moved. The, the, Dells, the Dell family came to the United States, immigrated to the US in, from England in the late 1600s. So they had been living here a long, long, long time. And in 1844, George Dell, who was to become my great-grandfather, was born in New Jersey, where the family lived ever since they'd come to America. He was raised as a Quaker, and then later on during his life, he worked as a farmer, a rancher, a school teacher, a lumberjack. He did lots of things like that. But when he was 13 years old, his family moved from, uh, from New Jersey out to Homestead in northwestern Iowa in 1857. So he moved there in 1857. Elizabeth didn't move there until 1875, nearly 20 years later. George served in two Illinois infantry regiments during the Civil War. We think he was a medic. That's part of the family lore, but uh, we don't have documentation of it. And supposedly, he walked all 350 miles back to Iowa from the South after he finished his service in the, the Civil War and, and, and the Union troops that were then in the South at the end. And that's when he resumed farming. And I say this about, you know, there's, there's family lore. It's, it's interesting. We all grow up with stories that we hear from our families. Some of them are just based on family myth and legend. Some of them are based on what you'd like to have the case, be the story of your family, but not you don't really know necessarily. But everything that I'm going to be telling you in this presentation is based almost entirely on facts that are documented, historical facts that are documented in various records and in um, an interview with my great-grandmother, Elizabeth Dell, in the 1930s. I'm sorry, let me go back here. Okay, so. George came out to that part of Iowa in 1857. Elizabeth came with her family in 1875. And apparently, their farms were very close to each other. And at some time, they met. And in 1883, they were married. Now, George was 39 years old. And this was his first marriage. Elizabeth had just turned 20 years old. And both families were opposed to the marriage. Uh, Elizabeth's Lutheran family didn't want her to marry, quote, a Yankee 20 years older than she is. And George's Quaker family didn't want him to marry, quote, that little German girl, end quote. <laughs> well, you can see what happened. The marriage lasted 42 years. They had six children, and she also had several miscarriages. But she had six children, and four of those then survived to adulthood. Three days after their wedding, they moved west to Homestead in the Dakota Territory. And this was what was happening in this time in the US. George had learned he could make money 
uh, in cattle ranching in the lands that had been newly opened up in the Dakota Territory. And it all was because of the Homestead Act and the fact of taking land away from the Indians. Where do you get the land that you're gonna let these settlers homestead on? You take it away from the people who are already there. At least that was certainly what was happening at that time. So the Homestead Act, which was, uh, which was enacted in 1863, provided that the head of a family, as long as they were a U.S. citizen, could claim, a hunt, stake out a claim on 160 acres of this land that had been opened up to them. Within six months, you had to build a house on it, a structure that you actually inhabited. If you lived there for five years, the land became yours. If you wanted to buy it before the five years was up, maybe you're putting together different parcels of land and want a bigger farm or a bigger ranch, you could purchase the land cheaply. So the Homestead Act is what provided the, the from the American citizen's side of point of view, the legal framework for people to come out and, and build, uh, you know, build a farm, build a ranch, build a house on this land that of course they had taken away from the Indians. Now we don't know in the family how George and Elizabeth felt about moving out on land that had been taken away from the people whose lands it had been for thousands of years. Um, I imagine that like most settlers, they just felt that it was an economic opportunity for them. You know, this was a better way that they could make more money than, than being farmers in Iowa. And that's why a lot of people moved west. But I don't, we don't have any sense of whether they thought they had any moral qualms about it. All right, that's something that we don't, don't know in the family at all. But I hope you can see this map well. When they moved out there, it was the Dakota Territory. It wasn't North Dakota and South Dakota. The, the Dakota Territory didn't become two states until 1889 even though this map shows them that way now. So what you are seeing is the land that was taken away from the Sioux Indians in that area. And over on the left-hand side where it says the Black Hills, if, it, if the map showed this also, if you just went all the way up to the top of that kind of beige striped area, it would say Cave Hills up at the top. That's where the Dells homesteaded, up in that northwest corner over there. And then Gradually, over time, the land, more and more land was taken away from the Sioux Indians. So now you can see in red, that is showing the reservations as they are currently located, all right? You can see how much land just in that particular area was taken away from them because of, um, you know, giving it away to, to, the, uh, to the settlers. So what happened was, on three days after their wedding, they took a train, they could get a train, as far as Kimball in the Dakota Territory, over there on the right. And several months later then, in 1884, they made the rest of this route that's marked in red on the map. And that's a total of 400 miles. They traveled in two covered wagons. Each one was driven by one, one of them. George drove one, Lizzie drove the other. They had four cowboys, several horses, and a herd of Black Angus cattle. It took them four months to make that 400 miles because they had to find water for the cattle along the way and cattle drives aren't fast anyway. And they finally get up to the Cave Hills area. By then, Liz was already pregnant with her first child. And along the way, they, they stopped for meals, of course. They had to eat on the route. And so what they did was she had a little iron stove that was in the covered wagon and they unloaded the iron stove from one of the covered wagons so Elizabeth could cook. And for fuel, they just gathered uh, dried uh, cattle dung along the way because there weren't trees out in that area. And over here, I've got the two books that she had with her. This is her Bible in German, which is also was happened to be published the year that she was born. And then this is one of the two cookbooks that she had on the ranch too. And both of these have been inherited by by members of our family. And Elizabeth had a reputation as a very good cook. She enjoyed baking, and it was probably most likely a skill that she actually learned from her father, who was a master baker. And this is what she said was a midday meal on the trail. Homemade bread, fried bacon, canned tomatoes, coffee, and juice from the canned tomatoes if no water was available, because water was a real problem, sources of water in that part of the country. 
And this is a quote, every other night she also baked bread on the trail. And here's how she described it. When on the road, I sponged the yeast about noon, you know, made the yeast and flour sponge and let it bubble up, covered it in a kettle. When we stopped in the evening, I set the stove in the tent and mixed the bread stiff with flour before I went to bed. I told the cowboys on the night shift to when the bread was so high, when the bread had risen, call me usually about midnight. I got up, washed myself, mixed the dough into loaves and went back to bed. I told the boys when it was light to call me to start the fire. And that was about then three or four o'clock in the morning. Then I baked the bread before we started on the trail. When the bread was done, we finished breakfast. We scooped the fire out to cool off the stove so the boys could load it on planks and put it back into the wagon. So she did this every other day for four months. I mean, think about it. We have it so easy now compared to what people had when they were living at that time. And this is, by the way, the rolling pin that one of the cowboys carved for her while they were on that trail route. And it's, it's large, it's 22 inches long. And it said that in order to get, keep, to keep the cylinder of it straight and keep it all the right, the right diameter all the way through, that the cowboy used a, um, a, a baking, uh, what is it, baking, baking powder can. All right, baking powder had been invented by then, and she had baking powder with her as one of the supplies, and he cut the ends off, both ends off the can and used that then to carve the wood as he went along so that he would get it perfectly straight for her. And so this is uh, some of the, the rock formations out in the Cave Hills area where they moved. And after four months on the trail then, they, they get here and they, they arrived on the land they bought. It was located on a creek known as Bull Creek and it's due west of the Standing Rock Indian Reservation up there. And one visitor described it as a good place to make money but a poor place for a civilized being. And this is the view from, one of the views from their, their ranch house after they got there. So the, the, the uh, the rock formations I just showed you were just a little bit farther west of that, but they were all in that, in that same area that they were living on. So the first thing that happened was that George built a one-room log cabin on the property. This is not a picture of it, but it was very similar to that, according to the written records we have. The cabin was 12 feet by 1 feet, a one-room cottage with a sod roof and a dirt floor. George, Elizabeth, and all four cowboys slept in the same room together. And Elizabeth was, was the only white woman within 100 miles in any direction. The nearest doctor was at least through two days horseback ride away. And that's probably why Elizabeth, when she was ready to have the children, she got pregnant when they were out there and every, uh, several times. And when she was a couple months before having the child, about seven months pregnant, she would go back home to Iowa, which was a long trip, to have, have the children, have the baby at her parents' house. And when the baby was old enough to travel, she'd bring back it and any other kids who'd gone with her from previous pregnancies, brought all of them back and forth. Can, can you imagine all the distance they cover and with kids too? And one thing I remember, another story was that she said that uh, one day, one, one morning she woke up and it had been really, really cold, a blizzard had come in that night, and her hair had frozen to the mud that was used to chink the logs in, the, in that cabin, and that they had to cut her out of it because it, they couldn't melt it because it was so cold in there. So it, it wasn't an easy life. Well, when she was back having her first child, then, you know, she was pregnant, when they, when they went out there. And then when it was time to have the child at the end of 1884 and beginning of 1885, she had gone back in to, uh, to Iowa to have the first child. And while she was gone, then George built this house for her. And that is a photograph of it. It's a photograph made many, many years later. But this is the house he built in, in the winter of 1884, 1885. And so it had three rooms a combination sitting room and kitchen in the middle and a bedroom on each side. And plus there was a basement storage room, a separate bunkhouse for the cowboys and a smokehouse for preserving meat. And one visitor described it as the largest and best ranch house in the whole region. And this is the house that Sitting Bull visited then when he came to visit my ancestors there. 
So the first time Sitting Bull came was while the Dells li were living there in the summer of 1886. 1886. All right, Elizabeth now is back in Iowa again, awaiting the birth of her second child, John, and he was later to become my grandfather. So Elizabeth is back in Iowa again. It's 1886, and later on, she described it this way. She, she told this from what her husband George told her. Sitting Bull came with four other men of his tribe, one of whom was an interpreter. They came to George for help because Sitting Bull had sore eyes, and none of their traditional Indian remedies had helped. George treated him with one of his own homemade medicines and then fed all five of the Indians. And during that visit, did I just, oops, sorry. Yeah, during that visit, uh, that's when Sitting Bull also sold George a peace pipe for $5, which was a lot of money back then. And I don't know how this transaction came across. I'm sure Sitting Bull wanted the money and he was, he was really good, he was a really clever fellow about things like that. And so anyway, he sold him the peace pipe for $5 and then every time that the Indians came back and visited them, then they all sat around, the, the men did, with my great-grandfather George and the, uh, the Sioux Native Americans smoking this, the, the peace pipe in their own personal ritual of friendship. This is a photo made of the actual peace pipe many, many years later, and that's my great-grandfather, George Dell, in the upper right corner, and my grandfather, John Dell, in, in the lower right. And this is one that the family had made before, later of that. Okay, so when the Indians were moved onto the reservations, they were supposed to plant crops and feed themselves. And then the food would be supplemented. The government made arrangements, made treaties where they would say, we will submit, we will provide you with so much beef or so much flour and sugar, other food rations that, that, that you need. But the Sioux had always been nomadic hunter-gatherers. They weren't big farmers and they weren't successful as farmers on the reservation lands, which were not good farmland. And then when, they, when the government started cutting their reservations on, on the lands, they grew more and more hungry, the native people did. And so they were given permission to leave the reservation, officially leave the reservation in spring and in autumn to go hunting in, th in the, the, the lands, the hunting lands that had been theirs before. And so they, Sitting Bull though, he didn't follow the rules very much. He, uh, he often left, left the reservation whenever he wanted to. And those were some of the times that he showed up at, uh, at the Dells Ranch. But as they came through on their, on their hunting trips, they often came to the Cave Hills region because there were, there were antelope and other good animals there. And they camped on Bull Creek in front of the Dells Ranch because this was a really good source of water. The women also learned that Elizabeth would feed them. Well, women and men both learned that Elizabeth would feed them whenever they appeared. And according to Lizzie, I'm quoting directly here, they came in covered wagons, came into the country to hunt deer and antelope every year. When they came to the house, they always motioned to me in their mouth to eat, fried bacon, cookies, cake, etc. If there were more than eight of them, they sat on the floor. One time Sitting Bull came with six men. He told me how women admired him. I fed the group, sat them to the table. They ate their pie, cake, and cookies first. Then they finished up with the meat and potatoes. One Saturday, I made rice pudding for coming Sunday. George looked out of the window and said, your friends are coming, three wagons, then three more. Put on more potatoes, made bread and fried bacon, and fed about 30 Indians that day. I fed the Indians every time they came. I never let one of them go by. George used to say, Lizzie, Lizzie, don't you stop to think how far I have to haul that food? And I'd say to him, if you were downright hungry and in their place like that, wouldn't you have a kind feeling for someone if they would feed you? And he would laugh and say, you really believe in the scriptures. Well, when he talked about hauling food, this is what he's referring to. Since they weren't growing their own food out there, they had to get food supplies. And so every May, July, and September, he drove a buckboard wagon 100 miles each way, a three-day trip each way, 
over the prairie to Dickinson, North Dakota, which was also the railhead that was, you could get, supplies could come in by train up there. And by the way, there were no roads. You know, you're just, just setting out over the prairie, although some of these buckboards did kind of make their own trails that they followed back and forth. But it wasn't an easy way to get supplies, and they only did it three times a year. And this is the train station in Dickinson, North Dakota. In September, George and the cowboys would take all the cattle that they were going to be selling. They would herd them up there, put them on the train going to the meat markets in Chicago, because this, this train went to Chicago, the, the, the tracks did. And then they bought supplies for the next seven to eight months on the ranch and loaded all that up and then brought that back on another three-day trip to, to the ranch. They also had, oh, these are some, this was one of the shopping lists she had. Uh, they had sacks of flour and smoked bacon, boxes of coffee, a barrel of sugar, raisins, currants, and dried apples, cases of canned tomatoes and peaches, that with the lemons, they got fresh lemons that they could keep for a while and, you know, several weeks in, in fresh water in a barrel. Those were their only sources of the kinds of vitamins that we take for granted now, too. And so it was really important to them to get those things. And they also, of course, had access to the wild game that was out there. And uh, the same animals that the, that the Native Americans were hunting, too. And Liz was good at smoking fresh meat to preserve it for months, for several months. She said, I used to take the hind quarter of a deer and antelope meat and make a sugar cure brine and salt them down and then smoke the, the meat like I did back on the farm in Iowa. We had a smokehouse made of logs and plenty of good, hard, dry wood. I assume from construction projects of theirs left over and things like that because they didn't have wood around there. Otherwise, he had to bring the wood in from, from elsewhere. And one of their visitors wrote that it was the best smoked meat he had ever eaten. They also had access to these wild plants that she wrote about in, in her reminiscences of living there, the wild fruits and berries that, that she foraged, and again, just like the native people foraged for, for thousands of years. And she made jams, jellies, and mincemeat pies using their own beef, real mincemeat pies, well, the ones that have beef in them. They seldom had fresh vegetables. Lizzie had a small potato patch near the house, but the soil was so poor that they couldn't grow anything else but a few potatoes. And all of these are things that she actually described as their meals. A typical ranch breakfast was bacon, fried eggs if the hens laid, and baking powder biscuits or bread, yeast bread that she made. In winter, they had beef, and in season, deer or antelope, and then those canned tomatoes and peaches for lunch. And then for dinner, potatoes from their patch near the cabin, canned fruit, cookies, pie, uh, cookies, cakes, and pies when eggs were available. And of course, all of her baked goods needed eggs. And this is a quote from Lizzie. The first year, I bought a dozen chickens in Dickinson. We kept chickens, so we had eggs to bake with. Second year, couldn't bake cakes, no eggs. Later, hatched a few chickens, and then we ate them. Only kept a dozen chickens because we had to haul grain 100 miles from Dickinson to feed the chickens, and it didn't pay to keep more of them. So you always had to balance out you know, what you what you wanted to have as supplies and what you had to haul as supplies to, to keep yourself going. Now, this is one of some of the recipes, the reasons I wanted you to, some of you to sit closer. You could see the recipes that were written down by her, by her daughter and by her granddaughters. And this one is for potato dough, doughnuts made out of potato dough. And all of these things are just the kind of staples that you would find in the ranch kitchen, the flour, the sugar, eggs if you had them, a few dried, dried spices and that sort of thing. This one for rocks, I assume rocks were a really hard cookie looking at the recipe. That was one of her daughters wrote that down. A granddaughter wrote her spice cake recipe. As you can see, they're, they're really simple. And if you've, if you've got recipe cards from your grandparents, they'll be like this, they just have a list of the ingredients. They don't tell you what to do with them. They don't give you instructions because you're a cook, you're supposed to know how to do that, right? So there's not usually instructions on the other side. We do have a little instruction here for the ginger cookies that she made. 
and one of my cousins made them, and that's what they look like. So she did that last year and made them for us, and we got to eat those. Also, when the Indians camped nearby on Bull Creek, Lizzie took her two little sons to the camp to play with the Indians. And she said later, they weren't afraid of Indian women, because that's, except for her as a white woman, the Indian women are the only women, other women, that they were used to out on the ranch, and the only other people they'd see. And when they, presumably, when they saw a white woman, when they went back to Iowa with their mother, they cried because that was strange to them, you know. So they played, with, they played with the Lakota kids. The Dell children grew up out on the ranch bilingual in English and German, speaking English to their father and German to their mother. And um, it's presumably they learned some words of Lakota too. I mean, as you would as kids playing together, you know, uh, you're certainly gonna probably pick up a little of that language too. I just wish that my, my, my grandfather died when I was three years old, so I did not know him. And I just wish that I had known him and been able to ask questions like that. You know, did you, did you learn this? And what kind of games did you play with the, with the Lakota children and, and all of that? Well, also Lizzie recalled uh, that one evening when the Indians were camped on Bull Creek, George told her that a child had been born there that afternoon and she should make coffee for the mother and also fruitcake for the mother. And this is quoting Lizzie. I took it to the new mother on Saturday and told them that I'd made that for the squaw with the papoose. On Sunday morning before they broke camp that day, a young squaw brought me a hind quarter of deer and motioned that this was a reward for my kindness to the new mother. The Sioux also brought other gifts to the Dell family. According to Lizzie, every time they came, they brought moccasins for me and the children. That's all I wore on my feet at the ranch. You know, you look at these now, I, I'm sure they weren't fancy beaded ones like this, but these are Sioux moccasins. And you see these in museums now. And I think my grandfather grew up wearing those as a kid, playing, you know, it's just, how close we are, if, at least if you're my age, if you're how close we are to those touchstones in American history that are so different from, uh, you know, those things of everyday life that are so different from the way we live our lives now. Uh, but one time she returned to the ranch from Iowa after she had a new baby, and well, they, I'm sorry, when, whenever she returned from Iowa with a new baby, they always brought tiny little moccasins for the baby too. But one time she returned and the, the, ch the child she had with her, Charlie, my, would have been my uncle, my uncle Charlie, uh, at, at a young age, he died. And then that summer when the Lakota women came and brought moccasins for him, she, told, she motioned to them that he was in heaven and that he had died and they wouldn't give her the moccasins. And she presumed that it was because they had a superstition about giving a gift for, um, you know, for someone who was, who was dead, someone who passed away. We would think, oh, that's something I can use on my next, set, my next child. But they wouldn't do that at all. And then Sitting Bull also gave this knife to George. And it's obviously not a knife made by, by the Indians. It's obviously a trade good that they got in trading for something else. But it, and it looks kind of like a boning knife, doesn't it? I would imagine that they use this for like removing sinews out of an animal. They use sinews for sewing, for sewing hides together. So I assume it's something like that. This is one of the, our family's treasures. This is a signed photograph of Sitting Bull. The photograph was made in 1884. Obviously it's a studio, studio photograph, you know, with the background behind him. And, and nicely dressed and all this. And he gave it to her in 1889. And this is what Elizabeth said about this photo. Sitting Bull came up to the cabin with an interpreter and held the picture in his hand while the interpreter told me Sitting Bull was giving it to me because I'd been so kind to his people and fed his tribe whenever they came by. But I had to give him the, my picture with my three children taken in Iowa as he wanted to hang it up in the Indian agency at Standing Rock to show his braves who I was. Then he kissed me and he told me via the interpreter that the women in Washington wanted him to kiss them and that I should consider it an honor. <laughs> <laughs> and George, George kidded Lizzie about that the rest of her life according to, according to their children, all right. So this then is the Standing Rock Reservation 
east of where, this is, this is where Sitting Bull Lynx people were forced to live. And it was 120 miles due east of the Dell Ranch. And by the autumn of 1890, though, things were happening that would make big changes out in that area. Uh, several groups in, of Indians living in the Dakotas began to be really agitated. It's a complicated story that I'm not gonna go into in detail here, but partly they were tired of the way they'd been treated on the reservations, which is understandable. They were certainly upset at the government for cutting their food rations. After all, the government has to use money to pay to people for the beef to give to the Indians, and the government's always trying to cut costs, right? So they were cutting the food rations for the Indians, and the Indians were understandably upset about it. And some of them began performing a ritual called a ghost dance, which Sitting Bull, by the way, supported. And it's a ritual that uh, they thought, they thought would reunite the living with the spirits of the dead. It would end the westward expansion of white people. It would unify Native Americans, bring peace and prosperity to them again, that it would bring back the buffalo which was so important to them and which was nearly extinct. And they even thought that going into this dance and, doing, and going to the trance when they're going into the dance, that the shirts that they wore would protect them from bullets. And all of this was, of course, tragically not true. The trouble was, uh, and understandably from the other side, the US government and the settlers out there saw this as the beginning of an Indian uprising and a kind of as a resistance and a threat by the Indians. So now things are not getting good out there. They're, they're getting much more unsettled. This is a photo of the ghost dance on the Pine Ridge Reservation, which is south of Standing Rock. It's, it's the lower part of South Dakota now. And at this time, several ranchers in the Cave Hills area where the Dells lived were concerned about the possibility of conflict with those Indians who seemed to be on the warpath. Elizabeth had had a miscarriage that summer of 1890. Her health wasn't good, and she wanted to take her four-year-old son, John, her only living son now, back to Iowa for the winter. But everyone at the ranch told her, don't make that trip. Three days, 100 miles across the prairie to Dickinson, where she'd have to get the train to go to Iowa, but it was too dangerous. And they all said, you, you have little or no chance of surviving the attack. But she was really adamant about going. And you may have gathered there's some strong-willed people, women in my family. You know? So she said, I'm going. And so she did. In the autumn of 1890, she, her husband George, and little John set off on their buckboard going north to Dickinson. And early in the journey, they noticed an Indian scout who was following them. He never made contact with them the whole three days, but he followed them the entire time and kept them in his sight the entire time until Elizabeth boarded that train to go back to Iowa. And the Dells firmly believed that the Indians and that Sitting Bull had provided that safe escort for them across the prairie. Lizzie later said, crossed the reservation once and everybody said we'd never get across alive. No harm came to us as we had an escort in the distance. And so the way I look at it now, knowing that story, is that I have Sitting Bull in the Lakota to thank for my being here because that little four-year-old boy in the buckboard was my grandfather. And that's how he stayed. He remained alive. So I'm glad that I'm able to tell you that story today. I should have kept it on that one. Let me move to the next one. This, though, is this, the tragedy that happened in December of 1890. On December 15th, because of all, during all this unrest, Sitting Bull was killed by Indian Agency police at the Standing Rock Reservation when they tried to arrest him. And two weeks later, the photo on the slide, the uh, Wounded Knee Massacre occurred near the Pine Ridge Reservation. And that killed nearly 300 Lakota Sioux, including women and children. And it was one of the last military actions by the US government against Native Americans on the Northern Plains. It broke the Indian resistance, finally, to the westward, expan westward expansion of white settlers. So you would think that that would be the end of the relationship between the Dells and the Lakota, but not so. 
Despite all of that, despite that tra tragedy, the friendship between the Lakota Sioux and the Dells continued until the Dells finally gave up ranching there in the mid-1890s. They still came to visit the ranch, Lizzie still fed them, and they still brought moccasins for her and her children. With the end of an era for the Dells between 1894 and 1895, they decided that ranching was no longer profitable, and they weren't the only ones. There were a lot of people who gave up trying to, trying to make a go of it in that part of the country because of droughts and blizzards and wolves, and it, it was, they lost too much cattle, and the price of cattle was also falling, and so it wasn't economical to stay there. So in 1894, after Elizabeth had another miscarriage, then she decided to move back to Iowa and wait for George to sell the land and the cattle, and he was able to do that in 1895, and then moved back there too. And they returned to Iowa and farming, uh, they, he moved back in 1895, and she was already there, as I said, from the year before. And in 1897, George built this house for them on the, the farmland that, that he still owned there. So in the, the lady in the light dress on the left-hand side is my great-grandmother, Elizabeth. That's my grandfather, the little boy, my grandfather, John, and my great-grandmother, Matilda, from Prussia also, the, the lady in the black dress on the right. Oops, sorry, let me do this one. And so Elizabeth, this is her now with two of her granddaughters in the 1930s. And the whole thing is, because we have these family stories, because George and Elizabeth really treasured their fond memories that they had of their relationship with Sitting Bull and the Lakota Indians, and they passed all these stories down to us, their direct descendants. So obviously I grew up hearing this too. And George Dell passed away in 1925 at the age of 81. And remember he was 20 years older than Elizabeth. Elizabeth lived until 1945, just two months short of her 82nd birthday. And think about this. She had been born in Prussia before the automobile was invented, and she died in America after the atomic age had begun. So think about all the changes in the world this woman saw in 81 years of her life, and what experiences, too, of, of you know, coming across the ocean and the kinds of ships they had back in 1867, and living in New York City, and living on a farm in Iowa, and knowing Sitting Bull in the Lakota for that 10-year period of her, of her life after that. So I just want to add a few postscripts to this story uh, about Sitting Bull's peace pipe. It was inherited by John Dell, my grandfather, and, and George's oldest son, John, and then John Dell's eldest son, Robert, my uncle, inherited it, all right? And so there was Robert and his siblings, my mother, and this is a picture of my mother. In 1965, Robert sent uh, to all of his, his, his brother and his other two sisters, he sent the, the, the uh, peace pipe around so we could all keep it for two weeks or a month or something like that. So I have actually held Sitting Bull's peace pipe. And this is a story in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram in 1965 about the peace pipe with a picture of my mother holding it. And then in 1988, Robert Dell decided he would donate the peace pipe to the University of California at Northridge, which was his alma mater. And unfortunately, when the big earthquake hit in California in 1994, it pancaked that building that, that, that the Peace Pipe was in at the history department there and completely destroyed the building and everything in it. So we no longer have the Peace Pipe. The family still does, not me, but some of my other cousins who inherited this, uh, still have the original picture that Sitting Bull gave to Lizzie and the knife that Sitting Bull gave to George. And this was something that I found really interesting that I, that I learned fairly recently from, uh, from some of my cousins. Sometime in the 1930s, George and Elizabeth's youngest daughter, whose name was Ellen, she was born in 1900, Ellen wrote a poem about her parents' friendship with Sitting Bull. 
but no one saw that poem until her own daughter discovered it in, in Ellen's papers after she passed away in 1987. And it's a long poem, but this is the conclusion to the poem. My sons played in your camp, camp, listening to your tales, listening to tales your mother gave you. The songs of your tribe, weird chants and haunting melodies lulled them to sleep. Tonight I will pray that in adulthood they remember a chief championing, championing his people in the face of continued adversity and uncompromising hostility. May they recall and say, thus died Tatanka Iotanka, Sitting Bull, the medicine man of the Sioux. And in researching this, I came across another quote I want to end with. This is from Iron Teeth, a Northern Cheyenne woman who lived out on the, the Great Plains, the North Plains at the time that the Dells did. And she said, I used to hate all white people, especially their soldiers, but my heart has become changed to softer feelings. Some of the white people are good, maybe as good as Indians. <laughs> and I just want to give a shout out to the Dell family members who supplied information for this presentation. And if you are interested in reading any about this, um, the, the 1938 South Dakota Historical Collections has an entire section written by this W.H. Hamilton, written by him and published in there, which tells a lot about when he was working as a cowboy out there in that area, time he spent at the Dell Ranch, lots of good stories that I don't have time to tell you here. And then later his recollections were also published, much later, I believe this was by University of Nebraska Press, um, not too many years ago. On the left is Homesteading in South Dakota. This was written by one of my cousins, a direct descendant of George and Elizabeth also. She has a PhD, it's a really well-researched uh, well book. She made it only for the family members, but it is now in the archives of the Smithsonian Museum of, Native, um, of the Native Americans. And on the right, Our Friend Sitting Bull is a book that was published in 2021 by another one of my cousins, and this is a book for young adults. Again, to get them to, to, to read about people who came from very different backgrounds and led very different lives and who became friends and how important that friendship was for them. Of course, crediting our, our photo sources. And now I'll be happy to, if we've got time, answer some questions. Thank you. Sharon, that was fabulous. Any questions, comments, protests? <laughs> She's got a question back here, Tom. Let me wait till that, because okay. otherwise we'll be running back and forth. Could you be more specific in Northwest Iowa uh, that you're talking in terms of towns today? Okay, the towns in Northeast Iowa, my grandparents were actually married in Decorah, and I have a lot of relatives that, that lived around there. And then over from there in that northern part, if you go west from Decorah, that's, that's where it is. Tom, can you remember the name of the town we were in? We were there just last summer. The reason I'm yeah. asking is because there were some Hellwigs in the town that I grew up in Iowa. Tell me, tell me the town. Rock Valley, Iowa. I don't, rem I don't recognize the so name the of the Rock town. It's on the Rock River. It's about halfway between Sioux City and Sioux Falls. Yep, and my mother went to school in both Sioux City and Sioux Falls. There are a lot of hallways out there that you knew, so if you knew them, any of them, you've known some of my distant cousins because they all immigrated from that area in West Prussia at, you know, over different years, but a whole bunch of them came. They all, to the United States in around the 1860s, and I mean, after, after the Civil War, the late 1860s. Did, was it ever? spelled with an H-E rather than an H-L? No, they have spelled it all. It was H-A-H-L-W-E-G when they lived in Prussia, and they changed it to H-A-L-W-E-G when they got to America. There are H-E-L-W-Gs too, and that might all go back to the same families in Europe, you know, hundreds of years ago. But I do know that families named Hallweg, H-A-H-L-W-E-G, actually lived in that part of, of what, we, what was Prussia when they left, uh, as back as far as the 1500s. Questions, and, comments, protests. <laughs> no, there, ah, young lady here. 
<laughs> I think you're our youngest guest. Yes, what question do you have? Uh, uh, where, what did the, the place that the pipe was, what did it look like before, before it was, the earthquake came? <laughs> it looked like I had in the picture there, it was really, really long like this, and, and there was a certain stone, I forget the name of it, but it was a certain stone they used to make the part that the tobacco actually went in, where the fire was, all right? And so that came off, and it was kind of uh, the color of rusty red earth, all right? But uh, the only pictures I have are, the, are these here, yes. But you saw it was long. It was like this. It wasn't like a little pipe like this. This one's real long like this. And everybody passed it around. Everybody spoke, smoked the same pipe. You didn't each have your own pipe. You, you, it belonged to somebody, and if he was the host and you were the guest coming to his place, then he would light it up and pass it around to all of you, and everybody would smoke out of the same pipe. It's a good question. Yes? I would like to know, uh, you showed that first picture of the first house that he built for her out there in mm -hmm. South Dakota, mm -hmm. and it was just basically a square, right? Was yeah, just it was twelve. It was inside. twelve feet by thirteen feet. Yes. Okay, and then she went back and had a baby, and went. It, it, I don't know which baby it was, but when she came back, the house had been enlarged. Actually, yeah, he, he had built a much bigger house by then. Yes. Was 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 any of the original house that he built? in that one, or did you just uh, add on to it? I don't know, but I, I would assume that he took the lumber from that and then expanded, all right. But, oh. you know, obviously he'd have to take at least two walls off because he went on to a much bigger place. I'd have to look at the, uh, we've got the plans for it. I'd have to look at the measurements to answer your question. Uh, but you didn't waste anything out there. So I'm sure that he, you know, at least dismantled part of the house he had before, the one room one, and used that as part of the construction material for the bigger one. And it was known, it's been written about by, in other places and other historical collections. It, that, that three room, some people have described it as a four room house, but they all have the measurements. It was the largest house in that part of the Dakota the territory. House. The other yeah. thing I wanted to know was, uh, when I looked at that, that photograph, the, the one that, uh, the second house, mm -hmm. it did, was the kitchen kind of in a separate part of, I mean. No, no, the kitchen and living room were all one room in the center. All in one room, because yeah. I know that some of the pioneers here in Texas, they used to have what they would, they had like a. A, a summer a, kitchen. A breezeway in between yeah. the real house and the other, because so often the kitchens would catch on fire. Exactly, and that's why a lot of houses in the South had even a summer kitchen, because you don't want all that heat in the rest of your house. And not only is it the, the problem of fire, but you don't want the heat. But up in the Dakota Territory, except for sometimes on the scorching summers, you want that heat in your house. That's, that's what's keeping you warm. They had the opposite problem we had. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Questions, okay. Your grandmother sounds like she was tough as a boot. <laughs> when she would go back to Iowa, uh -huh. did she go in the wagon? Did he take her up and she took the railroad? Yep. Did one of the men go with her so she would be safe? Yes, yeah, she didn't She didn't drive herself. I'm sure, because they had to get the bag, wagon back to the ranch. So somebody went with her and most likely it was her husband. And then, you know, put her on the train. But still think if you're about seven months pregnant, a hundred miles, three days, on just across the prairie, and in a buck. If you ever ridden in a buckboard, those things are not comfortable. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's amazing that they did this. And actually, when she went, she had her first child in Iowa, and that child uh, had problems, uh, health problems, and maybe I think didn't even speak for two years or something. She grew up to be a normal person. I, I met her when she was. 91 or 92 years old, and I was a kid. But at the time, when she was born in Iowa, but her mother had gotten pregnant on the ranch, the mother didn't, Lizzie didn't even bring her back to the ranch because she left her with, with her own parents, the, the kid's grandparents, in Iowa for health reasons. And so it's the other, other children lived out on the ranch with her. Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated story. I want to ditto that remark. Sound like tough ladies. 
I really think so. Just, just think about it. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I've seen one of the houses that they lived in that's falling apart now up in in uh, in northern northern Iowa, one of their farmhouses, and you just think, oh, you know, even living like that was civilization compared to the ranch house that they've been living in, and still it was it was was not an easy life, not at all. But then I maybe I shouldn't admit it, but I am old enough to remember going to visit them when I was a really really small child up in Iowa. And you know, nobody had indoor plumbing, all right? I remember places where you stay, where you know, there was no indoor plumbing, all the things we take for granted now. You had to haul all the water from the well or water from the creek. And um, yeah, with, it's a lot easier. Our life is a lot softer these days. Question, yes? I imagine that she nursed all her babies, but what did the children eat when they were real small? I would assume she nursed her babies. We don't know, but that would make perfect sense, you know, for, for that era. And they didn't have a milk cow. They did have one story, I recall, about getting milk from somebody else who had a milk cow um, that was another rancher. So, but then they would have used it for cooking, too, and things like that. But uh, to my knowledge, we don't have any stories about what the kids, they, what the parents ate. I mean, you know, you probably just mashed up, you know, fed, fed them mashed potatoes and, and shredded up beef and things like that, I assume. You know, I remember Hold on just a second. Let me bring you the mic. Uh-huh. Oh, that, that brings memories of me uh, 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 and a neighbor. I'm from Pennsylvania, northeastern mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. And I can remember a neighbor. First of all, we were the only people that had a bathroom because my dad was a chiropractor and he had to have, uh, you know, he, he, we were only ones that had a telephone too. Yes. Yes. You know, he yeah. had to have, and the summer before I, before I was born, my mother said they put in a bathroom. So mm -hmm. it's like you're yes. trying to identify with what you're saying. Everybody yes. had an outhouse. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, um, I personally remember neighbors who lived behind us the mother, those mothers nursed their babies. This kid was like five years old and still nursing her mother. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, I, I, mean, I saw that when today. I was a child. Yeah, yeah. Really, I just thought of that. I had forgotten about that. But yeah, so these <laughs> kids, they nursed their kids till they were big, and mother's milk is a complete food. Mm -hmm, I just yeah. read that recently. Mm -hmm. Too bad I didn't know that when I had my babies because <laughs> they made you start feeding them cereal when they were six weeks old and it was running oh, out. Oh yeah, mouth. there's 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 been so many different theories about how you should raise kids and now well, they're going back to say mother's they, milk has got some of those things that protect you from illnesses, you know. Anymore so, yeah. <laughs> I hear that you can nurse your baby at least for a year and it's got everything the baby needs where mm -hmm. we were forced to feed them start feeding them at six weeks old. It was hard. Uh, yep, yep. That was modern baby raising, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, the, uh, many of the Texas native tribes, they noticed they were nursing until they were 12. That late? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they nursed them. Back here in the back. Yes. Let me do uh, her and then I'll come back. <laughs> I know with some of the tribes, if someone gave a white man a peace pipe, it was almost a safety measure and that the word got around and if you had a peace pipe, you were safer because an Indian had thought enough of you to give it to you. That's interesting. I, I, I haven't heard that and that, that would fit with the stories that I actually know from documented facts in, in the She's family. a distinguished anthropologist, so she knows these she things. She knows what she's talking about. Good, good. <laughs> Thank you for, for telling me that. That's interesting. At the bigger house, what did the kitchen look like? I wish I knew. <laughs> we very don't simple. Very simple, right, right. We don't, we don't have any photographs of the interior, yeah. That's that's true. She she might have. Yes. Question. I, and I'm gonna come back with that house question in a minute. But yes, go ahead. I was just curious about how your interview with Julia Child went. Oh, <laughs> you can watch that on on YouTube 
through the the Allen TV channel. Okay. Well, yeah. If you'll Google, hey, Tom, Tom uh, will tell you how to Julia do Julia Child Allen Public Library. It'll it'll, surface. it'll come up. Right. I wanted to answer one more thing though about the house. We do know from W. H. Hamilton's uh, autobiography about living out there at the time. He said that. There was some time when Lizzie was off in Iowa having another child, and, and George had been out hunting, and he found an orphaned sh bighorn sheep, but a little one, okay, the lamb, a bighorn lamb. I believe that was it. It was something, it was some kind of animal like that, and he, or maybe it was a fawn, but he brought it home. He put it in their bedroom, because there was a bedroom where the children lived, and there was a bedroom where George and Lizzie lived. Now, mind you, Lizzie's away. He brings this, this little animal in. I guess he's going to feed it and nurse it so that it survives, right? You know, get it some kind of food that it would survive. But Lizzie's best quilts that she had handmade were on the bed. And this little animal just ran circles all around there. And you can imagine what that animal left in this trail as he ran circles and circles and circles. And the author, Hamilton, said, I don't want to, I'm glad I, I, I'm glad I wasn't there. I didn't want to be there when Lizzie got home and saw what had happened to her bedroom because it was just a mess. Yeah. <laughs> and there's other stories about, you know, shooting skunks and trying to eat them, uh, you know, trying to eat porcupines. Uh, uh, George apparently shot a wild goose and was going to have it for Thanksgiving because I didn't have any have anything like a turkey, and it was absolutely terrible. There are there are many many stories that are fun to read, and they are a lot of them are in Hamilton's book and in the other one, the the book by my cousin recently published in 1921. Um, I mean in 2021. Uh, yeah, all I these dates. You know? <laughs> yeah. I discovered Sharon about 10 years ago. Or longer, 12 years, 15 it's years longer, ago. Longer, yeah. Yeah, it's more like 20. Um, <laughs> I, we were going to show, we showed Babette's Feast here, um, the, the movie, mm -hmm. and I wanted to have somebody introduce it that, you know, was more knowledgeable about the movie than I am. And, but I thought, well, we can't fly anybody in or anything like that. So I looked at all the credits in the movie, every single credit. I don't care if they were uh, what they used to call them. A grip, that person who <laughs> carried things. I didn't care if they had anything to do with that movie. I wanted to hear, and I saw consultant here, and I went McKinney, Texas. Oh, no, no. Close enough. <laughs> no, 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 Tom, Tom. You you have a wonderful memory for many things, but that's not quite the story. But it's better story. It's a better story. And he also knew you were on the credits. No, no, I was not on the credits, but I wish I were. Or well, how did I find you? A friend, uh, you found me because you asked someone who taught film at uh, Collin College, and she knew that I had been a film professor for 20 years, and she wasn't available to come talk, so she recommended me. And then you called me, and I said, yes, I'd be glad to do Babette's Fest because in, we were living in Germany at the time the film came out. And we lived in Munich, which is one, Munich and Berlin are the two centers of filmmaking in Germany. And so we knew people there who were in the film business. And friends of ours, the, a man was a man who had a studio that does dubbing films. The Germans don't have subtitles on their films. They have, they, they dub over. They have an actor play all of it in the German language, or actors and actresses. And this man's wife had gotten the job as Babette's voice, okay, to do the German version. She was a French woman, so she could be speaking German with a French accent. Perfect for Babette's Fest. And it happened that one day I was reading in Bon Appetit magazine, because I subscribed to Gourmet and Bon Appetit and Food and Wine and all that when we were living in Germany, the American versions of those. And there was something about people who had put together a dinner party based on Babette's Fest, Babette's Feast in, in English. And that night, we were giving a dinner party, and this couple came, the man who has the dubbing studio, and his wife who'd gotten the, the, the role as Babette. And so together, we all decided, let's do Babette's Feast here. And so we reproduced in Munich a couple of months later, Babette's Feast, with people who were connected with it. So the connection is there. If you saw the German version of it, with the person who dubbed it and the people connected with it there, you would have seen my friends. But you, I, your story's a lot better than mine. <laughs> also, she cooked everything in that movie, we and that movie it. had hundreds of things. Yeah, we did. We and had it must a wonderful have cost time, you a fortune. But 
it was except one thing they, you couldn't do the tortoise couldn't do you're right you're right we could not do the tortoise soup because that's that's outlawed to to have one last little story that. she has led tours to uh, on the trans-siberian mm -hmm. railroad i mean you name it she's done it <laughs> now you know what impresses me about your great-grandmother she really in, it seems like she was influenced by the quaker and lutheran and I think I think by by her Christianity because she grew up in a German Lutheran church and then certainly George her husband by his Christian faith too, although I I did not know until I was very advanced in my age that I learned that they that he had a Quaker background until I found you know I was in my forties I found that out it was a big surprise to me because the family wasn't raised all of us as Quakers and when I saw his obituary. In a, in a bunch of family papers that I inherited, I believe he was a Congregationalist, all right? You know, that was a Congregationalist service for, for his death. So I don't, I, you know, it, it wasn't a big thing in, the, in my mother's generation or in my generation, but obviously from then on back, because apparently uh, it, it, I believe that the, his family, the Dells that, that immigrated to the United States, came over with William Penn. Well, obviously they had a, a, were imbued with the value of sharing mm -hmm. and caring and nurturing yes. rather than conquest and dominating and, yes. and controlling. Yes, and, and that's what they you know, brought up their children and grandchildren to have those values, which I think is very important and ones we need to remember in, in this, this world today. Last, one last question. Okay. She's got them. Good for you. <laughs> Are you going to be a filmographer? Is that what they call? <laughs> She's great. <laughs> what did the train look like? What did the train look like? I can tell you that much, okay? It didn't look like trains at all today. It was big and black and the wheels were taller than I am, much taller than you and taller than I am, just, just standing next to a wheel. And those trains ran on coal or wood. And so somebody had to shovel all that into the, into the boiler of the train and steam came out the top and it made a lot of noise and it left uh, particles of black that came down and, and got all over you if you were near that train from the, from the burning coal or the bur burning wood. And as a child, when I was your age, or maybe just a little younger, I grew up here in Texas riding the last ones of those, those kinds of trains, those big old steam engines. My father was a fireman on the railroad and he was one of the people who shoveled coal into the boilers of those trains so they could run. So I. The first time I rode a train was to go up there and meet my grandmother and some of the people in this story when they were still alive, when I was six weeks old. I'd just been born, and that was my first train ride, and that took me on one of those kinds of trains uh, up to Iowa, where they lived then at that time. And so I've been riding trains since I was six weeks old, and including more than 45,000 miles logged on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. So, yeah, I was and many say others. That the, the firemen had a very dangerous job because a lot of times the boilers exploded. Yeah. And if they didn't feed it just right, if they put too much coal in or they didn't feed it enough, mm -hmm. it could cause a fluctuation and explosion. Mm -hmm. A lot of those firemen ended up with lung diseases from the soot. Mm -hmm. And um, did your grandfather have any No, no, this was my father. But they, they, they uh, discontinued those trains around 1950. Mm -hmm and then they changed over to diesels. And so he worked for another, he spent 20 years total on the railroad and 10 years were with the steam engines and then 10 years with the uh, diesels, yeah. Now, last one, the, the Julia Child, so you entice you to watch the uh, <laughs> program. Um, her handler, um, Julie, handler Julie, Ch Julia Child's handler said, you got 30 minutes, that's it. And at the end of 30 minutes, the handler came in, and Julia, said, Julia Child told the handler to beat it. She was enjoying her talk with Sharon. <laughs> and, and it turned into two-hour interview instead of the 30 minutes that I was officially allotted for that. And she remembered that six years later when I met her at a conference, and she asked me about the article that I wrote about her. So I thought she has a phenomenal memory. And 
I can tell stories like that, and everybody I know who knew Julia Child has got a story like that, too. She was quite a lady, quite a person. And there are some really good books about her, good biographies of her that have been published, too, that are worth reading. So, Sharon Hutchins, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.